Welcome investors to the Absolute Return Podcast, your source for stock market analysis, global macro musings, and hedge fund investment strategies. Your hosts, Julian Klamachko and Michael Kesslering, aim to bring you the knowledge and analysis you need to become a more intelligent and wealthier investor. This episode is brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. Welcome, podcast listeners, to the Absolute Return Podcast. I'm your host, Julian Klamachko. I'm joined by my co-host, Mike Kesslering. And on today's show, we welcome special guest, Chibi Labs founder, Matt Sposta. Chibi Labs has created three futuristic NFT collections featuring cool 3D characters. On the show, Matt discusses his path from Wall Street to NFTs, or TradFi to DeFi. What is an NFT and why should people want to own them? Chibi Labs' roadmap in 2022 the future of the NFT market, and more. So with no further ado, here's our discussion with Chibi Labs founder, Matt Sposta. All right, really excited to have Matt on the show, and we're talking about everyone's favorite subject these days, NFTs or non-fungible tokens. Prior to getting into the whole NFT world, what you're up to at Chibi Labs, I wanted to touch on your career trajectory. You did come from a traditional finance background, stints at Lehman Brothers, Barclays, Wells Fargo, do you want to talk to us about your career prior to getting into NFTs and what you were up to before Chibi Labs? Yeah, so um, thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. Uh, I'm Matt Spasta. As, as you mentioned, I'm one of the founders of Chibi Labs. Uh, I did start my career on Wall Street. I started at Lehman Brothers in 06. And as most of you can imagine, that was a really fun time to get into finance. <laughs> Um, you know, the first, the first year of my career was, was amazing. I mean, Lehman, the culture, everything about it was just such a, a welcoming place. And it was, the, that was like the heyday of finance too. Um, 2000, late 2007, 2008 rolled around and, you know, watching 60% of the workforce get laid off leading into, you know, the recession, all the craziness that happened with the bankruptcy was, um, I'd say probably one of the best lessons I could have learned in my career. It's definitely a character building exercise. I was retained. We were acquired by Barclays. Um, but it, it really taught me a lot about risk, about risk management. And it was kind of just like, you know, getting thrown in the fire really early in your career definitely helped me, you know, you know, build certain disciplines. Um, and it's definitely gotten me to where I am today. So as terrible as that kind of moment in time was, I think it was, it was definitely something that really kind of helped with my maturation. You know, my experience on Wall Street, I was uh, most of my career in wealth management with kind of an institutional twist on it, though. My, my partner, you know, used to run a, a, a convertible bond desk for Lehman Brothers in over in London. So I had a, a lot of expertise in markets. So it was really kind of a, a market slash relationship type role. But I always had kind of that entrepreneurial spirit, um, always really kind of ahead of the curve in technology and innovation. I got into into Bitcoin and crypto in 2013, pretty early considering. And I just, you know, understanding the way those markets were working and, and just given sort of my background in, in traditional finance, you know, it really got me thinking about how this market could be impactful and disruptful, disruptive in the future. And also, I mean, I was just an action junkie and the fact that it was a 24 seven market was amazing. So the bell would close and, you know, the, the, the crypto markets would kick, kick in. So that was something that was always really exciting to me. About five years ago, uh, two, two guys in my high stakes fantasy football league approached me. They were thinking about doing something in the space, but, but needed a big idea. I came along with the big idea, which was building fantasy sports on the blockchain. So this was 2017, which was my first kind of foray into, into the blockchain space. It is, you know, my first startup in the blockchain world exposed me to this entire space. Um, we went out and raised pretty significant institutional capital behind that business. Uh, and I had to tell my wife I was leaving my high profile Wall Street job for uh, a startup in the fantasy football space. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Must have been a tough con conversation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, now she looks back and she obviously enjoyed the ride, but not all the not all the ups and downs of you know being a founder and kind of being in the in in the entrepreneurial role. But you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm you know ditching my suit five years ago and and entering this world has really opened up my eyes and it's allowed me to do a lot of things I wouldn't have otherwise been able to do in the finance world. So that company I actually sold uh, a year and a half ago to what was at the time. 
time, a private company, which is the for-profit arm of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, they ended up going public for a SPAC merger that summer in July um, and becoming HOFD, which some of your audience may be familiar with. Um, and I just recently launched that league um, in September, the start of the football season. And um, yeah, we've been building, building the league um, from within that public company ever since. Right. And so the goal of having you on the show is to open the audience's eyes to the world of NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So just to set the stage, can you talk to us about what exactly is an NFT and why should people want to own them? Yeah. So I think, I think everyone, especially your audience, would be very familiar with, you know, the term fungible. And I think everyone understands, you know, a, a fungible token in the cryptocurrency world would be considered a Bitcoin or Ethereum or something else that's ultimately fungible. I mean, we could go into the definition, but I, I think people should be familiar. Um, what makes NFTs unique is they're non-fungible, which makes every NFT unique in, in its own right. Um, NFTs at the highest level are digital assets. And because they're non-fungible, each one is unique in its own right and has its own properties. When you look at kind of the early iterations of NFTs, CryptoKitties was probably the most popular uh, in 2017, 2018. Then came along CryptoPunks, uh, which from you know an art standpoint are, are kind of known as these cultural, historical you know timepieces for digital art. And since then, you've seen the popularity grow through Bored Apes and some you know, other big projects. Um, the thing that drew me back into NFTs was really NBA Top Shot. Mm. Uh, I'm a sports fanatic. I come from the sports world. And I saw that Top Shot got into the space by partnering up with the NBA, getting IP and licensing rights from the NBA Players Association, and basically digitizing these moments, uh, which are really video clips, and selling them out as almost unique collectibles. When I first started buying them, everyone told me I was crazy. <laughs> I, I, I told them, well, people have been buying sports cards for 50 years, so what's the difference? And you know, a year later, <clears throat> you know, Top Shot has definitely had its ups, ups and downs, but Dapper Labs, the company behind Top Shot, just released their NFL product, and it's just a thriving business right now, and that really kind of opened my eyes to what the space could be. Um, the next product that I got into was Zed Run, if you're familiar. It's the horse racing game, and again, my background's really in sports and gaming, and when I saw the gamification properties that came out of Zed Run and the ability to own these kind of unique digital assets, um, these unique digital assets were horses. They had their own, you know, rare traits and attributes that dictated their ability to race and compete against other horses. You basically could take your horses and you could race them, you could hold them, you could breed them, but it created this beautiful ecosystem. And, and you know, people started doing things they were never able to do before, like take these NFTs, these collectibles, and put them up against other people's horses and race. And there were purses for each race. So it was almost like a, you know, gambling meets, uh, you know, video games uh, with crypto all tied into it. And that was just so fascinating to me. And then the next iteration, and mind you, this is this has all happened within the last year. So if you think about how many iterations and how quickly the space is evolving, it's become really fascinating. Right. Uh, but this is kind of leading me to to where I am today, which is kind of the the digital art revolution that you're seeing right now. And you know what really caught my eye were the bored apes. Um, I got very involved in sort of PFPs. Um, in I'd say March or April time, which is very early considering the the type of move the space has had, but what really attracted me to this is not necessarily the art, but the communities that were formed around the art was the economies that were formed around this, the ability to trade, the ability to buy and sell, the ability for there to be zero friction when transacting, the 24-7 nature of these markets – and also the behavioral stuff that was generated from these markets. And it's not it's like nothing I've ever seen before, you know, because I come from a markets background. So, you know, taking the equity markets and the bond markets and then enhancing that into what the crypto markets became and kind of the influence the community had over those crypto markets. And then adding one additional layer here to which is the art or the utility that's coming from NFTs, which I really think was the one thing for me that I saw the future for this as being something really unique and something that we've never experienced before. And I became fully immersed in it and I've never looked back. One thing that NFTs, it seems, really go hand in hand with 
uh, something called the metaverse. And you could, I've heard plenty of uh, varying definitions of what the metaverse actually is. In your opinion, what's what's your definition of of the metaverse? Yeah, you know, it's funny. There, I, I think there's the, the perception of the metaverse right now is what is it? Where is it? How could I, you know, how could I find myself in a metaverse? And what does it mean to be there? Um, I I have a really loose definition of the metaverse. Like I I consider what we're doing right here almost like being in the metaverse, right? It's just it's it's a it's a digital or virtual uh, environment where we're interacting. So it's not this intimidating. It has to be like you know, Decentraland, where you're in this closed ecosystem environment. But if you even look at what's happened with Clubhouse and Twitter spaces, and forget it, even going much bigger and broader, something everyone's familiar with, but Zoom calls. I mean, you know, it's it's fascinating, but we've made this transition. COVID really helped accelerate it. But people have moved from in-person meetings to Zoom calls. People have moved to seeing their family in person to using FaceTime and As scary as it sounds, I see a world in, you know, five to 10 years where we have our VR headsets on or or our kids have their VR headsets on. They're sitting on the couch. They do their classes all morning. Then they play video games with their friends and then they, you know, interact with their friends and watch sports and watch TV all within a one foot by one foot radius. And it scares the crap out of me because it's (laughs) like, you know, we're moving towards this this world where we could get everything from an experiential standpoint that we need in our lives right at the, you know, the tip of our fingers. And it's, it's a scary thought because obviously we grew up in a time where we'd run down the street and play sports with our friends. And, you know, people would rather stay in and play Fortnite with their friends with their headsets on, but we're seeing this shift happen. And the shift that you're seeing is a shift into meta behavior and meta interactions. And it it's already been happening for many years right now. It's just now people have, you know, coin the, the term metaverse and you have, you know, folks like Mark Zuckerberg coming out and, and basically justifying this transition. So the, I think the validations occurring from like, you know, all the, the, the big players in the space and, and the transitions actually happening. I, I think the, the bridge between the NFT space and the metaverse is a different conversation though. And now a word from our sponsor, Accelerate. Do you want to diversify your investment portfolio while benefiting the planet? The Accelerate Carbon Negative Bitcoin ETF, symbol ABTC on the Toronto Stock Exchange, provides investors with exposure to Bitcoin while protecting the environment. Accelerate implements a global tree planting campaign to sequester carbon emissions and help fight climate change. Up to 10% of ABTC's 69 basis point management fee will be allocated to Accelerate's annual tree planting campaign. For each $1,000 invested in ABTC, an estimated one net ton of carbon dioxide is expected to be sequestered each year. Buy Bitcoin, save the planet. Find out more at investabtc.com. I believe that NFTs will play a major part in the so-called metaverse, which will only become more and more popular in the future. So I wanted to talk about your involvement as the founder of Chiba Labs and just to give some context and, and disclosure. So I'm a fan of the project. I do own uh, the Chibi Ape and then recently minted the uh, Chibi Galaxy, which is always fun. So it's uh, super fun collecting the NFTs and I'm sure developing it was a blast for you. Do you want to talk about the idea behind its founding and how it came together? Yeah, sure. So as, as I mentioned, I was just a, a collector and a really passionate collector. And my partner and I actually stumbled across the art. There was a early collection of Chibi's, Chibi Genesis, um, that was put out by, um, you know, the original artist is Fabs. Um, Fabs is, is now our partner. But uh, my partner, my, my third partner and I started buying up the collection and we loved the art. We loved kind of the 3D nature of the art, and I'll mention some of the reasons why in a minute, but uh, we reached out to the founder and we said, hey, you know, what does your roadmap look like? What are your plans for the future? Um, And he's just like, I have to be honest with you guys, like I'm having trouble building a community, I'm having trouble marketing the project, and we're like, you have some of the best art in the space. And he's like, do you guys think you could help me with that? And this was around July time, right? It's kind of the, the space was really kind of growing and coming together. And 
you know, we, we had an idea, obviously, just given the popularity of the apes, we said, hey, you know, look, let's look to roll out a new collection of chippy apes. And we created the collection size and we created some of the, the, the art and the traits. And we set a date and we said, hey, let's take this out to market in September and see what we could do. So, you know, we basically went out to all of our network, got on Twitter spaces, we got on YouTube. And we just started peeling back the layers and unlocking our network in different ways and really marketing this just because the world kind of needed to see this artwork. And, um, you know, at, at that point, that was kind of early August. We had about 250 people in our Discord. Uh, five weeks later, we go to Mint in the first week of September. We built the Discord up to 15,000 people. Um, we sold out in a matter of 30 seconds. Wow. And we were kind of like the most talked about um most exciting drop that had happened in several weeks and at that moment in time i said holy crap i said i am no longer uh, you know just a collector and, and and not even just a founder but i now feel as if i am a fiduciary to our collectors uh because our collectors are almost like our investors and the analogy i always use is just, this is like a crowdsourced way of raising capital. It's almost like raising an IPO. Um, the only difference is your uh, your shareholders are now these collectors that could literally DM you in Discord uh, at any given moment throughout the day. And you know how you know how scary that could be. But <laughs> you know, at, at that point, I took on the responsibility of hey, you know, we're founders of this project. We have a really passionate community and audience uh, built around this. And, you know, this is one of the most exciting things I've ever been a part of. Um, you know, I've built communities in my career and I've never built such a passionate com community in such a, a short amount of time. And, you know, those are the things that got me really excited about the NFT space kind of being beyond being a collector. And just to go back to something that I had mentioned, the thing that drew me to this art in the first place, the 3D nature of it, um, our artist Fabs is so forward thinking that, you know, even his early drops, he built a 3D AR viewer. So you could take your chibis and you could view the 3D files, you could download the 3D files, and you could see them in augmented reality. And the characters are also rigged, which is a technical term, meaning they could be used for 3D motion graphics and animation, and then also for metaverse applications. So mm. we like to say that our characters are metaverse ready, um, but a lot of the metaverses aren't ready for us. So, you know, we like to think of ourselves as the bridge between NFTs and the metaverses uh, that we currently see today. And the exciting thing for us is for our collectors to be able to take their, their NFTs and their avatars and basically port them into whatever metaverse they're going into because at the end of the day, NFTs are really just a flex, right? Everyone mm -hmm. wants to flex their ownership of their NFT, whether it's unique, whether it's valuable, whether it's a crypto punk and you don't own a crypto punk because it's, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. And that's what this is all about. Um, so, you know, for us, we see a huge play into the metaverse. We see a huge play into AR and AR integration. We just did a really fun partnership with uh, JDU Hologram who's behind the jetpacks and the hoverboards. They just launched their hoverboards. Uh, they chose five projects to basically be their partners. Uh, these are all 3D projects. Um, and they've integrated all of our characters into their platform. And then they offered our holders the ability to get onto their pre-sale. And it's just been such a huge success. But but again, you know, seeing Chibis in all these different environments to me is kind of what really excites me about the future of this space. And then kind of beyond that, you know, the, I look at this space and I think a lot of people are skeptical about the current art and the current utility and the application for this art. Right. My feeling is this. My feeling is um, that moment when we sold out the Chibi Apes, I said, you know, this is no longer an art project. This is a business. Yeah. And I will put on my operator cap and I will run this like a business because, you know, for for this business to have legs and to have long-term viability, we need to commercialize our IP. Right. We need to find you know new ways to sell this IP, and we need to find new ways to monetize. But ultimately, who owns the IP? It's the collectors. So I'm really working for our collectors and our shareholders to really build this brand, sell this IP, and monetize for everyone who's in the ecosystem. Yeah, and I'm super stoked that you guys uh, do, you know, grant the intellectual property to the token holders, the NFT holders, and not all projects do that. We have seen some controversy re regarding the CryptoPunks lately, just around the commercialization, right? So that's always something that's appreciated as a collector. But Matt, you mentioned a number of keys to success for having a 
collection, an NFT collection that can really take off. Number one is the art. Obviously, it needs to be aesthetically pleasing. And number two is the community. And you mentioned you built that. Uh, and the third thing that uh, it would be awesome to discuss uh, further would just be, you know, what's in store for the future. You mentioned now treating this like a business and working for the NFT holders. What can we expect, uh, the roadmap, and what can we see for uh, what's in store for 2022? Yeah, so so another one of the key pillars, because you touched on two of them, art and community, I think, are, are two of the most important. I think the third one, which we're starting to see uh, become more apparent, is the team behind it. Right. And, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of issues with teams and founders that are anonymous, and there have been some situations where you know, there have been scams, right. you know, from the very beginning, I've been very kind of vocal and in the public about, Hey, we're a group of docs founders. I've been extremely accountable and, and transparent with our, our community base too. And I think they really like that. I think they also really appreciate that, you know, we're not just some devs that <clears throat> launched an art project. We're actually, you know, real life entrepreneurs. Um, so I, I, I think the team is really meaningful and I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but I've seen a, a lot of, a, a lot of projects fail because they didn't have the right team in place. Right. Um, but when I, when I think the, the, the future success of our project and our business, ultimately, um, as I mentioned, I think the ability to monetize our IP, I think we've cr- developed a really passionate community. We have, you know, close to 60,000 people in our discord, close to 25,000 people on Twitter. People are really passionate about our art and our characters. They talk about how their kids love it. Um, you know, I want to become a household brand and, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, you, 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 you catch lightning in a bottle sometimes like the board apes have. Um, but you know, I've been talking to several brands and this is kind of my background and, you know, developing partnerships and things like that. I've been talking to several brands about becoming brand partners for us. And I think that creates a real opportunity to legitimize ourselves, uh, bring us to the mainstream and kind of bridge the gap with the, the average consumer. Um, I have some really kind of unique, um, ideas and thoughts around how, you know, our IP holders and, and collectors could actually monetize, you know, one of the big ideas that I have is, you know, if a brand were to come along and say, hey, we love the chibis and we'd love to take this chibi and they pick one out and they say, hey, that's that's the one that we want to use for our commercial or for our animated series or whatever, um, it would kind of almost be unfair to those folks who aren't necessarily entrepreneurial and weren't able to, you know, develop a relationship with the brand in their own right. Um, I have ideas around creating certain things like staking pools or casting pools where you, you contribute your chibi into those pools. Um, and if they get selected for any sort of commercialization, the entire pool would end up, you know, monetizing as a result. So this becomes a community exercise. You know, I have aspirations of taking this brand to levels, you know, and you may laugh, but levels seen by, you know, things like Pokemon and what Pokemon's been able to do with, you know, their collectibles, with their animated series, with their physicals, things like that. Um, and people may laugh, but, you know, just imagine the ability for a company like Pokemon to rise to the level it did with it being owned ultimately and wholly by, by the public. It's, it's completely different. It, it aligns different incentives. And what's unique about these communities in the NFT space is because the ownership is democratized. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, it creates uh, a, a, a lot more velocity when developing, you know, um, engagement and spreading the word. And, you know, if all of a sudden we do release a children's book around chibis, you better believe that every single person in our community that owns a chibi or a friend of a friend will hear about it because, you know, they're ultimately connected to the IP. Um, and that's truly how you develop network effects. So, You know, I think going even back to the original question is like why NFTs um, and I spoke very highly about the community. I think the community is going to create ambassadors um, and investors like we've never seen before. And you've seen it maybe um, historically with things like the Green Bay Packers, where they sold their team for actually to their to their uh, their fans. Um, But you don't see it. I mean, you don't. You've seen it maybe a little bit in public markets with people showing up for the Apple event, but you don't see people really coming out as passionate as you do in the NFT community for uh, for some of these brands and projects that we have. 
And you mentioned something that um, is really notable in the NFT space, and that is of network effects, where you kind of create ambassadors for the brand just by them holding it, because everyone's incentivized to build that community and see the entire value of that collection grow, just because it affects the value of their own investment or their own collection. So that is super interesting. And one thing that I wanted to touch on, and you know, as a project founder. I'm getting kind of bombarded with new NFT projects every single day. And it seems like the market's so saturated. I was wondering, how do you guys stand out and differentiate uh, your project from other NFT projects? And in addition to what you already mentioned, any other things that you're doing that's, that's unique that really helps you stand out in the marketplace and, and get collectors' attention? Yeah, I, I, I think some of the things that have become pretty standard amongst our collections, like the <clears throat> the AR viewer and the 3D files and things like that, is something that you haven't seen before in the space. Um, and, you know, again, we we rely heavily on our, our community um, to do certain things. Like we have contests where a community takes their 3D files and creates amazing videos and animations. And when you see that coming out of a community, you say, Hey, who are these guys? What are they all about? And I, I think it's it's one of those things when I talk about aligning incentives. You know, if you get people excited about some of the things that you're doing, if you're offering things that are unique, you grab attention from a lot of folks within the community. You know, with that being said, I, I think that's only the start of things. That's how you really grow the community. But ultimately, I think it's 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 really having the long term vision that we have. And you see a couple teams out there with really strong roadmaps. I didn't even put out a roadmap. I put out a one year business plan. And People were like, oh, my God. And I was like, that's accountability. You know, they're putting out a, a, a business plan to the, to the end of 2022. Um, right. But we, we discussed some of the things that we're trying to do. We want to host a ChibiCon for all of our collectors, which is a live event where they'll all come out. Um, you know, we'll have tons of partners there. We'll have, you know, a, a lot of really fun experiences. Uh, we're looking to build a studio ultimately, which is really uh, aligned around, um, you know, our ability to, to leverage our 3D files RIP to create uh, content and media and things of that nature. Um, there's something fun that we've been discussing around building a chibi experience. You know, all of these things I think are, you know, may not sound so innovative in the grand scheme of things, but when you t- tie in the NFTs, when you tie in the technology that powers them and tie in the communities that are associated with them, uh, it really kind of creates uh, it's a unique experience for everyone because you have this democratized ownership. You have these new ambassadors. Um, you know, you have leaders and and operators running the company, and it's just it's it's creating um, it's creating a, a new form of startup that we've never actually seen before. And because you have the background on Wall Street, how do you when you're looking at when, I guess when you're collecting um, with other projects and things like that, what sort of metrics are you looking at? when you're looking at valuation of, of a project? Oh, it's, 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 it's really tough because I throw all kind of traditional business metrics out the window when I'm looking at some of these things. I mean, um, you know, I think a lot of people could relate. There's kind of the short term trading versus kind of long term, you know, buy and hold, you know, the, the data that exists in the space right now is it, is somewhat non-existent. You can only go based off some of like historical sales and things of that nature. Uh, I think it's important to kind of track behavior. Um, and when I say behavior, it's I'm talking more about like, you know, buying and selling trends based on historical projects that we've seen. But really, this is more so I don't I look at this less from the trading lens as I would if, you know, as I would as an investor, if I was um you know, investing in startups, right? Um, So I look at this as more of, you know, what's the team? What's the IP? Is it differentiated? Does it have, you know, long-term viability? Is it defensible? Things like that. Um, So I really look at each of these projects almost as their own kind of like mini startup companies and businesses more so than I would uh, a public company. Now, here's where in lies the problem. It's, this is like, um, and I use the analogy for startup companies. This is like if a startup company that had a concept or idea and memo went out and raised, you know, a couple million bucks. And then all of a sudden the investors had daily liquidity and the ability to buy and sell, you know, the underlying equity of that project. It creates this really kind of scary precedent and the perception becomes reality sometimes. So, you know, if, 
I, I hate to say, it, but the valuation for a lot of these projects is usually viewed upon by the floor. And for those who don't know, floor just happens to be the lowest price. Now, the lowest price to me is typically representative of the people who are looking to sell and get out of the project. And depending on how many people are trying to sell and get out of the project, you could have them undercutting you know, the project to a really low point at some times. Now, what typically happens is if there's value investors, someone will come in and sweep the floor, as they say, or they'll buy some of the lowest listed ones and the floor jumps all the way up. This creates a really interesting dynamic. And this is not typical because you don't have you know market makers in this market. So it's a little bit different. Um, but again, this is such a nascent space marketplace right now that it's going to become more efficient over time. And you're probably going to see market makers come into the market at some point. So it's it's all happening. It's just not there yet. Yeah, speaking of market makers, I do know some that uh, make markets on OpenSea and the bid ask spreads are probably like 30%, if not higher. So the, the, right. the inefficiencies in the NFT market remind me of not like I was around for equities 40 or 50 years ago, but I'm sure it was very similar. Now, looking out into the NFT universe, not ex- or not including uh, Chibi Labs, what would be one of your favorite projects right now and why? As a collector. Oh, man. As a collector, the project that's really caught my eye is Doodles. And, you know, when I look across the ecosystem and I told you what, what I kind of look for in a project, the founding team from Doodles is great. They've been around the space for a really long time. They're operators. They come from the Dapper Labs world. They were around for the first launch of NFTs because they launched CryptoKitties. The art itself, I look at the art and some of the animation and creative assets that they develop and it it just it it touches me like I see it and I can see it being kind of like a, a cultural movement. I, I, I just see the, the whole aesthetic being something um, that could be really uh, uh, enticing to to non NFT holders in the future. Um, so that's one that that I've really kind of taken a liking to lately. And the more I dig in, the more I really like the community. Um, and I love some of the things they've done, the experiences that they've created. The one they just did at Art Basel was really fascinating. Um, so I think they're doing all the right things, and they've been around for. I think maybe only like seven to eight weeks at this point. And, um, you know, they've become, I think in my eyes and also the eyes of the community, really a blue chip. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you for uh, mentioning doodles. Now, say one of our listeners is intrigued by NFTs, haven't traded in any yet, but are thinking about it. What are perhaps some risks and challenges when allocating to NFTs? Yeah. So I'd say the, 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 the biggest risk is, um, you know, just like any kind of early marketplaces like this, there are definitely scammers out there and there are people who are looking to kind of hack your wallets and things of that nature. It's happened uh, by clicking on bad links in Discord or Twitter or other places. So I'd say that's probably the biggest issue and biggest concern right now if you're just getting into the space. It's just like be vigilant, um, learn what you need to learn in terms of securing yourself and protecting yourself. Um, I'd say kind of the 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 biggest pain point in the industry right now from an adoption standpoint is the friction Mm -hmm. uh, that exists when trying to actually buy an NFT. Um, It's a little bit of a complicated process. I could just walk through it at a high level, but you have to have uh, basically your on ramp, which is a place where you could, you know, bring bank money from like, that would be like a Coinbase or a Gemini or marketplace like that to actually buy your Ethereum because you need Ethereum to buy NFTs. Uh, then you're going to need to create your MetaMask wallet, which is something that could be scary. You're basically downloading an extension that attaches to your, your browser. Um, and then you have to send the ETH from or Ethereum from your, um, from your exchange to your MetaMask wallet, which is always a scary proposition, depending on how much money you're sending. And then just kind of understanding the nuances of it. So like the MetaMask is your wallet. It's where your NFTs and your crypto is actually held. OpenSea is the marketplace right now where you trade them, buy and sell. Uh, OpenSea shows your profile and it actually displays the contents of your MetaMask. Um, So, you know, just kind of getting the lingo down and really understanding you know, how all these different parts operate and communicate with each other, I think is really important. But once you're on the OpenSea marketplace, it becomes, I think, really easy to to navigate and to understand how to buy and sell things. The last thing I'll mention, which is the biggest surprise, once people get through all those steps, is when they go to buy something and they see the gas associated with <laughs> buying something, yeah. is I, I think one of the biggest challenges, because I've gotten people oh, all for that sure. point that they're like, I'm not paying $150 in gas, I don't even understand that. So for people yeah. listening, 
Uh, Ethereum gas is what powers transactions. What makes the Ethereum blockchain secure is there are people behind the scenes working to confirm those transactions and you're paying them a fee to do so. Gas prices are now exorbitant because the price of Ethereum has gotten so expensive. Um, so it's just, if you think about it, it's a toll you have to pay and it's what keeps your, um, you know, keeps your transaction secure. And now, a word from our sponsor, Accelerate, one of Canada's most innovative and fastest-growing alternative investment solution providers, with a suite of institutional-caliber alternative ETFs for investors seeking diversification and long-term performance. The Accelerate Arbitrage Fund, symbol ARB on the TSX, is the world's first SPAC-focused ETF, with a diversified portfolio of SPAC and merger arbitrage opportunities in an easy-to-use, low-cost ETF. The Accelerate Arbitrage Fund ETF trades under the symbol ARB on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. And along a similar thread, what's one of the biggest misconceptions um, of the ET- of the NFT industry that you hear regularly? One of the biggest misconceptions is that I think people think there are a lot of scammers out there, a lot of money grabbers. But like, you know, you look at any new market and any new industry and there's always going to be bad actors that come in and, and you know, look for opportunities to make money. Um, the people that I've met so far in the space, there, there's uh, a lot of really talented people on the art side. There's a lot of really talented people on the on the technology side. But I think uh, the sophistication, ultimately, from a business standpoint, for the project founders and operators, is um, is is ultimately not there yet, and it's coming. Um, so I think there are a lot of smart people coming closer to the space, and and that's definitely happening over time. Yeah, what's really cool about the NFT market is I believe we're still in the first innings, really, really early stages. I think it's probably analogous to crypto, say in twenty thirteen. Uh, if you think about how many people actually own an NFT globally? It's probably in the you know tens of thousands, probably not even more than 100,000 yet. So uh, a lot of growth potential, Matt. I was wondering, what do you think the NFT market is going to look like in 10 years? Yeah, so, so the, the current NFT market as we know it right now, um, and you know, I, I think the, the layer of art that we see right now is, I think, just kind of an early first use case to kind of prove the viability of this model. The underlying technology that powers NFTs is going to be something that disrupts many different industries. And I could give you some of the use cases. Uh, but I think in, in, in the communities that are developed, I think in, in the, uh, the democratized ownership uh, and you know, the way that people approach commerce now going forward, uh, is going to be changed forever because you know it's creating these amazing marketplaces for people to interact, engage, and exchange uh, goods. I think the you know NFTs that we see as art right now are probably not the future. I think you know um, what you're starting to see, whether it's kind of the utility that I've talked about, some of the access that you're seeing. I think V Friends has done a really great job of of kind of uh, just. Spelling that myth that it's not just about the art, but the utility of actually owning it is giving you access to certain things, whether it's the Gary, whether it's the Beacon, things like that. Um, and, and I think that's ultimately the future. I think there's, um, I think there are going to be really fascinating use cases that come out of this, especially in traditional markets, whether it's uh, titles or deeds that are then, you know, basically built along the blockchain and people have access to that. And it creates the ability to kind of, you know, buy and sell homes without going through the whole legal process. Uh, people have talked about insurance. Um, people have talked about, you know, real estate, even, even the ability to, to buy and sell real estate by itself uh, could be really another interesting use case. Um, but I but I think about, you know, the way this has impacted art and, and art in the kind of digital form. I think it's going to have the same meaningful impact on music. I think... Um, the ability for artists to get recognized in this market, this new NFT market, and for them to potentially sell their art and make money and make royalties each time it's sold is such a fascinating concept when you think about how music royalties have been handled for you know, however many years. The ability for you to put, whether it's an original song 
uh, or audio file that then gets used as a jingle for a commercial or used for a video or something like that. It's only right that the original artist gets paid their royalties and then you're no longer dealing with the licensing issues that sometimes people get cease and desist for. Um, so it's just making our markets more efficient. I think it's going to, the technology is going to unlock a lot of different things that we've never seen before. Uh, and I'm really excited for the future of it. Yeah, I agree with your viewpoints there with respect to the liquidity that NFTs and tokens can bring to what used to be illiquid assets. For example, if you try buying and selling music royalties, it's a huge pain. But if these were structured as NFTs, bringing more liquidity, it would just increase efficiencies way more and and eliminate so much paperwork and things of that nature. So Super excited for the future of NFTs, Matt. Thanks for coming on the show, explaining it uh, to us and, and our audience, and also what's in store with Chibi Labs. It's super exciting stuff. So wish you the best of luck and looking forward to seeing the 2022 roadmap. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your support of Chibis, obviously, and you know, hoping your, your audience and your listeners come out and maybe make it their first NFT. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks so much. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks for tuning in to the Absolute Return Podcast. This episode was brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. The views expressed in this podcast are the personal views of the participants and do not reflect the views of Accelerate. No aspect of this podcast constitutes investment, legal, or tax advice. Opinions expressed in this podcast should not be viewed as a recommendation or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities or investment strategies. The information and opinions in this podcast are based on current market conditions and may fluctuate and change in the future. No representation or warranty, expressed or implied, is made on behalf of Accelerate. As to the accuracy or completeness of the information contained in this podcast. Accelerate does not accept any liability for any direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage suffered by any person as a result of relying on all or any part of this podcast, and any liability is expressly disclaimed.